Okay, I think that's about ready to start. This uh, topic is uh, best arguments against intelligent design, at least what I consider to be the best ones. And for me, the best arguments against my position are genetic arguments. My position, uh, basic position, is intelligent design. There is some intelligence out there. Uh, I call it God. But there, at the very least, it's an intelligence out there that produced uh, us and all biological systems of complexity. And uh, so that's my position. What are the arguments against my position? Is basically what I'm going to present here. And then what are my answers to those arguments? Okay? Does that make sense? Uh, these are the uh, most common arguments I hear when I go and debate people, uh, like on Talk Origins. The first one is intelligent design answers everything. The intelligent design theory answers everything, therefore nothing. So intelligent design theory is utterly boring because the standard reply is, how did this happen? Well, God did it, all right? So that's a pretty good one. Intelligent design theory is thinly disguised creationism. And we all know creationism is wrong. So intelligent design theory must also be wrong. The next argument is intelligent design uses the God of the gaps argument, which is a logical fallacy. And so therefore it's uh, non-scientific. And the next one is intelligent design proposes no testable, falsifiable predictions that have not already been falsified. For example, irreducible complexity proposed by Behe a few years back, well, that's been falsified. Not, you know, things are reducible, nothing's irreducibly complex, so that's wrong. And specified complexity uh, pr uh, proposed by Dinsky, that's also been falsified. Uh, nature can produce very specified levels of complexity just as easily as, as anything. So that's, that's wrong. And the last one is no intelligent, does, no intelligent God would have done it that way. God is rather stupid if he made things the way they are. Okay? So, what about the everything and nothing argument? Does God explain everything and therefore nothing? Or does intelligence explain everything and therefore nothing? Well, I'd like to flip it around and ask evolutionists, I was like, does the theory of evolution explain everything and therefore nothing? So was it everything evolved by mindless nature or everything ultimately produced by mindless nature that we see today? So does evolution or natural process explain everything or at least attempt to explain everything and therefore nothing? Does it work both ways? Or it only worked against intelligent design? Also, how can scientists like forensic scientists, anthropologists, and SETI scientists propose intelligence behind certain phenomena when mindless nature could have done the same thing? So is it really true that intelligence uh, explains everything and therefore nothing? No, uh, if it explained everything and therefore nothing, there would be no science of anthropology or forensics or, or even SETI. Does that make sense? So what about the argument that intelligent design is utterly boring? William Proveen. He writes, the most basic problem with intelligent design theory is that it's utterly boring. Everything that's complicated or interesting about biology has a very simple explanation. ID did it, or intelligent design did it. SETI scientists are looking for particular types of radio signals coming from space as, evidenced by, as evidence of alien intelligence. If such a signal were ever found, would any scientist be bored by such a hypothesis? Is the truth boring just because intelligence is behind it? No. That would hit the front page of every newspaper in the world, right? 70 scientists have found ET. Is that boring? No. Computers also have very simple explanations. Humans did it. Like your laptop, anybody have a laptop in here? Is there a very simple explanation how your laptop came to be? It's humans did it. Is that really as... Is that inclusive enough about a real explanation of how your laptop came to be? Yeah, it's a simple one-liner, one, one liner, but that doesn't really encompass the full complexity of how to make laptops, right? Saying that God did it or an intelligent agent did it is not really encompassing the full complexity of how it was done. It's just saying that this could only have been done by intelligence. Also, just because something is simple uh, and boring, perhaps, does that make it false? Like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Simple, boring, perhaps, for most people in this room. But is, uh, <laughs> it's boring, yeah. I mean, but is 2 plus 2, 5 plus, 2 plus 2 equals 5, is that more interesting? <laughs> it's interesting, but is it right? Okay? 
How about intelligent design is a religion, therefore it's not a science? Religion talks about non-physical, non-testable, non-falsifiable truths, according to most uh, educated people. Uh, any examples? For, for example, are there examples of non-falsifiable truths? And here I've lifted some that are potentially non-falsifiable because they're in the eye of the beholder. For example, like beauty. That's commonly, you hear the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So it's kind of subjective. Same thing with joy. What makes somebody happy might not make another person happy, right? Or joyful. Love, too. You can know you love somebody else. Absolutely. You don't need to ask anybody else if you really love somebody. You know, you know, do I need to ask you if I love my wife? No. You know, you can't tell me that. I know that internally. Same thing for taste. Some people like certain types of foods that other people would gag at. Right? Or desire. What about mathematics, though? Is mathematics subjective? Is it internally derived? Do you need to have the physical world to help you with understand mathematics? In a sense, maybe it would help, but sometimes you can just imagine mathematics in your head. It's somehow, mathematics or the understanding of math is somehow given to you as a gift. It's internally derived. You can think about math in your head and do thought experiments without actually having to go and look at the real world. Uh, what about God? Is God something like mathematics? Is he an internally derived truth? Does God speak to you in a little still small voice inside your head? And that you can know that only God is talking to me. Some people tell me that. I've been inspired to tell you this. I've been inspired to tell you that. To be honest, I have never heard an audible voice in my head. I've never had a direct, what I would call a direct inspiration from God. And I can't tell you as an internally derived truth that God exists. Some people may maybe can because God has actually talked to them. Like some prophets say that God has verbally talked to them. Moses face to face. Right? That has not happened to me. Okay, so how, upon what basis then do I believe in God? Because he, he does not talk to me in little, small little voices that I can actually hear. I maybe have some sort of impulse or whatever, but maybe that's indigestion. I don't know. Okay, God... Uh, what about the argument of intelligent design uses the God of the gaps arguments? So do all scientific hypotheses. After a point, uh, no scientific hypothesis or even theory is absolutely provable. Everything is open to potential falsification. You come up to a limit in your evidence, and then you have to make a leap, a leap of faith before you can actually believe your hypothesis or theory is actually true and will actually happen in the future as you predict it will. You don't absolutely know. And in fact, if you did absolutely know, if you had absolute knowledge about something, science would no longer be needed. Science is only needed when you don't know complete knowledge or when you don't have complete knowledge. It's only there to help you interpret less than complete knowledge. That's what science is for. It's for those of us who are a little bit handicapped when it comes to adequate knowledge. That's what science does. If you have complete, adequate knowledge, you don't need science. Everything then is based on leaps of faith. It all depends on how big of a leap you're willing to take. Okay? So, the gap hypothesis isn't really valid in my view. What about the intelligent design theory has been falsified? If it has been falsified, what was it before it was falsified? A valid scientific hypothesis, all right? So to argue that it's been falsified is by definition recognizing that it used to be a valid scientific hypothesis. So then how can you argue that it was never a valid scientific hypothesis and then out of the same breath say that it's been falsified? You can't do that. You can only falsify things that used to be valid scientific hypotheses. Make sense? Okay. So let's go on from there. Let's just say, look at these arguments of things that have been falsified. Irreducibly complex systems do not exist. That's the claim that the whole hypothesis or idea of Behe that irreducible complexity is evidence of intelligent design, that whole idea has been falsified. Because random mutations do combine with natural selection to easily produce uh, what Dempsey would also call specified information. So his idea on specified complexity is also falsified. So um, let's look at some arguments for this. This is Kenneth Miller. He's a famous biologist from Brown University. He's written several uh, very popular books. It's made him a wealthy man just off his books alone. In fact, I think I should probably try to write some of my own. But anyway, 
He writes, the logic of their argument of ideas is that you have to, these multiple part systems and that the parts within them are useless on their own. The instant that I or anybody else finds a subset of parts that actually has a function, the argument of irreducible complexity is destroyed. Okay? So, for example, if I take a car and take out the motor, the lights and the radio still work. So is the car irreducible? According to Miller's argument, is it irreducible? No, because the lights and, motor, or the lights and radio still work. So even though it doesn't have the motor anymore, it's not irreducible because something still works. Make sense? Like a fish without eyes. Everything else still works, but you take out the eyes, you can't see anymore, but does the fish still work? Fish still works, so is the fish irreducible? Not irreducible, according to Miller. Okay? So here's a Kurt Thane, who's a staff science writer for life science. He writes, all of the systems that Beatty claims are irreducibly complex really aren't. A subset of bacterial flagella proteins, for example, are used by other bacteria to inject toxins into other cells. So because the flagellum I showed you movie of earlier, because a subset of its structure still works with a different type of function to inject toxins, therefore is the flagellum irreducibly complex, like Behe says, according to Miller? It's not irreducibly complex because you can take away a bunch of parts and the subparts will still work. Make sense? So here's the flagellum. You've got all these, there's lots of parts. There's uh, 40 or 50 parts, 40 at minimum. Uh, and it looks like a machine, it looks like a little motor, but you can take away all these parts and still have just this little piece left right here. It doesn't spin, doesn't do anything, but it still works as a toxin injector. It doesn't work as a flagellar motility system, but it does work. Okay, so here's the argument. One machine. Here's the argument from Behe. I'm going to present a little clip from Behe, his, his argument, and I'm going to present a little clip from Kenneth Miller and how he argues against Behe, and then I'm going to go on from there. Particularly attracted his attention. I remember the first time I, I looked in a biochemistry textbook and I saw a drawing of something called the bacterial flagellum with all of its parts and all of its glory. It had a propeller and the hook region and the, the drive shaft and the motor and so on. I looked at that and I said, that's an outboard motor. That, that's designed. No, that's no chance assemblage of, of parts. V.E.'s reaction was not surprising. For the molecular motors that drive bacteria through liquid, each depend upon a system of intricately arranged mechanical parts. These parts come into focus when portions of a cell are magnified 50,000 times. Biochemists have used electron micrographs like this one to identify the parts and three-dimensional structure of the flagellar motor. In the process, they have revealed a marvel of engineering on a miniaturized scale. Howard Berg at Harvard has labeled it the most efficient machine in the universe. These machines, some of them are running at 100,000 RPMs and are hardwired into a signal transduction or sensory mechanism so that it's getting feedback from the environment. And even though they're spinning that fast, they can stop on a dot. It only takes a quarter turn for them to stop and shift directions and start spinning 100,000 RPM in the other direction. And just like outboard motors on motor boats, it has a large number of parts which are necessary for the motor to work. The bacterial flagellum, two gears, forward reverse, water cool, proton motive force, it has a stator, it has a rotor, it has a U-joint, it has a drive shaft, it has a propeller, and they function um, as these parts of machines. It's, you know, it's not convenient that we give them these names. That's truly their function. Okay, so that's the one half of the argument. What's the counter-argument? 